Welcome to everyone to DataViz DC. We are excited to have you here. As we noted, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box if you like and add any questions that you have for Heather in the Q&A window. You see that little Q&A icon? The chat box can get filled up with so much information and we wanna leave that as your space to engage. I know we can't all be together in person, but we're excited to have such a diverse range of folks from all over the country and around the world, it seems like joining us. By way of introductions, uh, you'll see you've got a few different people on video over here on the side. I'm Amanda McCulloch. I am the uh, data visualization lead at Excella. I volunteer as the operations director for DataViz DC and or for DataViz Society, and I also am a co-organizer for DataViz DC. Uh, ben, you want to say hi? Hey everybody, my name is Benjamin Ortiz. I am one of the co-organizers of DataViz DC. Um, and I also work at AFS um, as a federal contractor in data visualization. I am really excited for this chat and I'm very happy that everybody's here. Uh, off to you, Will. Yeah, my name is Will Angel. I'm one of the co-organizers at DataViz DC. I'm also on the board of Data Community DC, a data education nonprofit here in the Washington DC area. And for my day job, I do data science at ICA Global. Very cool. Excited to have you guys here and excited to have everyone joining us. Over 400 people tuning in today. So psyched to have you all here with us today. Uh, the session today and our meetup in general is sponsored by Excella, the lovely tech consulting firm where I work. They kindly support things like our food and refreshment budget. And when food and refreshments aren't being sent around the world, they support our uh, speaker fees. So we really appreciate the time and effort that Excella puts into supporting the DC tech, tech community. Uh, behind the scenes here is also Abby Olson. She is our webinar guru at Excella who will be taking care of any tech issues that come up. So feel free to flag those in the chat and the questions. Uh, uh, the DataViz DC group is part of Data Community DC. You'll see DC2 down here in the lower right. Uh, the Data Community DC has made this statement at the beginning of our meetups for, I think, more than six months, maybe even a year now, because we thought it was important to be explicit around our values and the fact that Data Community DC believes that diverse communities are better and stronger, and that we aim to have inclusive meetups that feature a wide range of different speakers from different backgrounds, different uh, backgrounds technically, but also different backgrounds geographically, uh, demographically, all those different pieces. So if you have any questions about uh, both DataViz DC, but also the Data Community DC, feel free to ping those over to us as the organizers, and we're happy to take those in the Q&A, in the chat box. If you are someone who is in the DC area, we are pretty focused on DC folks, um, and you want to be a speaker for DataViz DC, we will continue to have these virtual events for the next foreseeable future. Uh, but we also do do in-person events when we're all able to gather together again at our meetup spot at Excella in Arlington. So if you're interested in being a speaker or have recommendations of people who we should reach out to, please feel free to email us at datavizdc at datacommunitydc.org. That is a lot of data, datas and visas and DCs, but uh, if you want to screenshot that, it's a great way to stay in touch with us or feel free to reach out to us via meetup.com. Our next upcoming event is July 7th. We have a project night. That's just a virtual online collaborative time for folks who want to share, give feedback, share ideas about projects they're working on around data visualization to get together and gather. If you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. We also have a couple other exciting virtual events that are in the works with some great speakers coming up in July, August, and September. So stay tuned on the meetup link for that information. If you have any other announcements, please feel free to add them to the chat. Uh, those of you who've joined us in person before likely know that we always open the floor to let people say, I am trying to hire for a job, looking for a job, I've got another cool meetup you should join us for, upcoming hackathons, conferences, anything else data viz related. So feel free to post those links in the chat, share that information. We welcome hearing from our members about those different opportunities for folks to engage not just in our meetup, but more broadly. So <clears throat> with that, I think this is a great time to go ahead and pivot off of the slides and go ahead and do a quick introduction for our key speaker today, Heather Krauss. 
Heather is the lead at We All Count, the We All Count initiative. She is a data scientist and someone who has been thinking and talking a lot about this issue of data equity and equity in data science and data visualization for much longer than the last few weeks or months. I think Heather and I first connected and talked about doing a session for Data Viz DC in person back when she was going to be passing through DC in April. And so as this all came together right at a time when it couldn't feel more timely and important for us to all think about and question the worldviews that we have and the ways in which we approach data and think of data as objective. I think there's no better time that we could be hosting this event and letting Heather share some of her wisdom. Uh, I know that you'll go through and learn a lot in the session from Heather today, but if you want to dive deeper, I'll give a quick shout out that I joined her uh, Foundations of Data Equity class last week, her online seminar. It was two half days and it was really interesting and thoughtful and a great way to start to uh, probe and think about the ways we think about data, not just about how we visualize it, but also how we collect it and how it gets funded and how we aggregate it and how it gets looked at and the ways in which our worldviews really influence what that really, what those data stories that we tell really are. So with that, Heather, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. We're going to kill our videos and hand the show over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think you're joining us from Canada. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Um, so we're excited to have you here. We'll hand it over to you, hand you over the screenshot, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say tonight. Again, everyone, thank you for being here. We have over 450 people, which is great. Um, and if you have any questions for Heather as we're going through the session, please feel free to put them in that Q&A box to make sure we see them and they don't get lost in the chat. And with that, Heather, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda, and the rest of the team uh, for having me. I, I was absolutely super excited to be coming down to DC. I lived in DC for most of 2018, working on um, a couple of projects, and I'm very, very fond of the um, Washington, DC community as a whole and the Washington, DC tech community in specific. So, um, Thank you so much for having me and um, for making this work remotely because yes, I, I am in Canada where I have uh, been for a while and probably will remain for a while. So um, one of the things I want to, two housekeeping notes I want to say right up front. Um, one is that there is no internet on uh, my entire city block. So I am hotspotting through a series of iPhones, <laughs> which will uh, hopefully not run out of batteries before I reach the end of the number of iPhones in my household and my neighbor's households. So um, if I go black for a minute, it's just um, because I'm switching iPhones <laughs> or uh, various other things. Um, second thing is that my experience in these um, fantastic community discussions is that there's probably way more questions and conversations than I'm going to be able to have in the time that we have together. Um, so what I'm hoping is that usually when we save the, uh, the Zoom call, um, it saves the, com the questions and the comments in um, a text file. And if that is the case, then um, I'll make sure that I take the time to go through all the questions and type out answers to them and circulate them back to all the attendees um, because I learn as much from the questions as you do. I know that's uh, a trite, silly thing, but it is in, in fact the way life is. Okay, so we're going to talk about data equity today. And um, one of the reasons that we're going, that I'm very interested in data equity as a data scientist is that um, we live, most of us live currently in a situation where there's a lot of conviction about the, um, the, uh, the object data and the importance of um, evidence, especially quantitative evidence in decision making, business decision making, public sector decision making, nonprofit sector decision making. And um, I think that the objectivity and the unbiased nature of quantitative data is um, highly overrated. <laughs> so let's look at a quick example. And um, if you're in the data world, you may have seen data that talks about the average classroom size. And so let's say we have a school. It has three classrooms in it. First classroom has one student. Second classroom has three students. And the third classroom has five students. Um, what is the average classroom size in this um, school. 
uh, you can just think quietly <laughs> and um, you may come up with the answer being three. The average classroom size in this school is three. And if you think that that is correct, however, there's the possibility that you may have come up with the average classroom size as being four students per classroom. Both of these answers are correct. The average classroom size in our school could be three or it could be four. How can there be two mathematically correct answers to such a simple question? And the answer to that is it depends on who you ask. It depends on whose lived experience you embed into the numbers, into the mathematical uh, calculation. Um, if you ask the teachers, which is what, uh, how most people are taught to take an average in an average classroom size, um, the first teacher says there's one student, second teacher says there's three students, and third teacher says there are five students. You divide that by three perspectives and you get nine students. That, I mean, <laughs> you divide that by three perspectives and you get three students. So most people would say that the average classroom size is three students. However, if you asked the students what their lived experience is, you go into the first classroom where there's one student and you say to that student, how many students are in your classroom? And that student says there's one. Then you go into the second classroom and you ask the first student, um, how many students are in your classroom? That student says there's three. Then you go to the second classroom, second student in this classroom and you say, how many students are in your classroom? That student also says there's three. And the third student in that classroom says there's three. Then you go to the third classroom and you ask the first student in that classroom, how many students are in your classroom? That student says there's five. All the students in that classroom say there's five. So now we have data that we've collected by asking the students what their experience is. And we add that up, we get 35, we divide perspectives we've gathered and we get four. So from the student's lived experience, the average classroom size is four. And from the teacher's lived experience, the average classroom size is three. Both of those are mathematically correct answers. <laughs> um, and there's a much longer video on YouTube that you can go watch that kind of walks you through the math. But I highly recommend more than anything is you try this with, um, with small dolls or beans. People can get very, very, very angry about this example and very confused because something as basic as how to take an average seems like it should be the same. It should stay the same. So I highly recommend that you try this. Um, but it's a very effective story in getting to the root of the matter that quantitative data has a perspective, lived experiences built into it at all times. There's no such thing as quantitative data that is objective when objective means has no worldview, values, or lived experience baked into it. The idea that data is objective is very appealing, um, but it is, in fact, not the case. <laughs> and um, I kind of came head to head with this. Um, when I was right out of grad school, I um, ha founded a consulting company and spent um, about half my time working in um, Bangladesh, Papua New Guinea, um, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, South Africa, uh, some places, a lot of places in the global south, um, collecting data and um, trying to understand how to use data to um, help the people that I was living and working with achieve what it was that ever they wanted to achieve. And I was doing this um, in collaboration with many, many different kinds of um, foundations and nonprofits and uh, local and national governments. And being on the ground in Bangladesh in particular really helped me understand that this is what data looks like uh, on the project that I was working on in rural Bangladesh, where we actually collected data using um, pictures and stickers because you didn't need to read and write uh, by doing that. And then, th so this is what kind of, we're talking about like raw data. <laughs> raw data is not an Excel spreadsheet. Even if it's a dirty, uncleaned, unaudited Excel spreadsheet or any other kind of, anything that is on your computer is not raw data. Um, 
and what I was doing was spending a lot of time uh, out in the field, collecting data, analyzing data, and then presenting data uh, to big, shiny, fancy boardrooms in Washington, D.C. quite a lot, um, Seattle, Toronto, Manhattan. Um, so I was kind of spending half my time uh, living in the global south and half my time living in the global north and realizing um, about a decade in that I had accidentally become a colonialist, um, that I was taking a resource data from largely from brown women in the global south pretty much repackaging it and selling it usually to white men in the global north <laughs> and that was never my intention the other thing i realized was that the way that the data was being done and the way that the data was being visualized were all deeply embedded with ideas sexist ideas colonial ideas homophobic ideas not usually with the intention to be any of those things, but also not with the intention to not be any of those things. That is when I started a case studies and some projects. For example, this is a project I was working on in rural Bangladesh where we were focused on helping build some um, infrastructure to increase the average monthly income of the people that I was working with. Um, we're not gonna go too much into the details for tonight, but on the right, is um, the project participants, which is people that were kind of in the training that the organization I was working for was delivering. And the people on the left is something called a control group. If that word doesn't mean anything to you, it just essentially means people that are a lot like the project participants, but aren't actually getting the training. And when we analyzed and visualized the data this way, we presented it to the big fancy boardrooms and we're like, hey, the project was a great success. The project participants are making so much more money. This is fantastic. Um, however, if you looked a little deeper <laughs> into the data, you could see that um, there were three um, distinct ethnic groups that existed in this uh, jurisdiction. And the experience of the three different ethnic groups when you um, disaggregated their data was quite different. You can see the red lines on the left and the right, uh, or the top lines, if um, you can't see the red. Uh, the top lines are ethnic group number one and their income increased a huge amount over the course of the project. Whereas the bottom lines or the yellow lines, ethnic group number three, um, their, their income didn't increase at all. So the idea that the project was a huge success on average was true, but the average experience was not the lived experience for many, many people. And then the third way that we could uh, possibly, the third of you know, dozens of ways we could look at and visualize this data is what the program is actually doing to the income inequality gap. Uh, in the community. And you can see that at the beginning of the project, the gap was um, about $20. And by the end of the project, the gap was $64. This is the gap between the people earning the most money and the least money. So our project, um, in fact, tripled <laughs> the income inequality in this community. So um, I started to build these case studies um, and try to kind of work internally in the systems um, and say, look, there's you know, a lot of um, value judgments being embedded because all of this math is correct but which one of these means that this project is a success? All these visualizations are, are done reasonably well. And I only got so far, so I decided that I was gonna probably have to leave the social sector and maybe go back to my original roots as um, high-speed uh, trading, data science or high-speed trading, because at least they weren't pretending <laughs> to do any good. Um, but before I did that, I decided I would just give it one more shot and. Um, start this new project that was really focused on equity and data. This is several years ago. I said first to avoid racism. And that I'm unemployable and just say everything I think <laughs> in a non, a non trying to ever get a job way. Um, and as Amanda says, this has um, kind of exploded in popularity in the last few years. And so um, we are now here um, giving workshops, building tools, um, coming together as a community, mostly around the questions. Um, the most important question being what is bias and how can we um, understand it, 
surface it in our data projects and correct it. And the most effective way we have found and developed over the past three years is something that we call the data equity life cycle. And that's looking at every data project through seven steps and um, using checklists and specific tools at each one of these steps to understand what worldviews have been embedded, what value systems and lived experiences are being embedded in each of these seven steps and um, changing those worldviews and making them transparent along the way. So um, we've tried this. Uh, we've tested this framework in a whole bunch of different settings, corporate settings, several big, large financial um, institutions, um, some governments, a lot of social sector settings. And we have found that this, these seven steps are fairly universal in that they exist. The wording and the languaging is quite different in uh, many sectors. So if I use languaging that's a little bit different than what you're used to, um, I'm happy to give some examples from whatever sector you're familiar with. Okay, so tonight is primarily a data visualization <laughs> group. Um, and you can see that the seventh step is actually communication and distribution, which is where we do most of our talking and tool building about data visualization. But I've worked a long time with data visualization professionals and um, in this modern world, I know that you're um, responsible for a lot more <laughs> than just the very final viz. So I'm going to touch on um, each of these seven steps briefly. And then when we get into analysis, interpretation, and communication, I'm going to go into greater depth because those are the three that probably are most applicable to your world. So the first thing we do in a data project is talk about the funding. And the reason that we care about funding or budget allocation is because we have um, really, really good research and data sets that show us um, how Goldman Sachs has been so helpful to keep tens of thousands of vulnerable college students um, in school. We have some great um, data sets and research. What we don't have is any research that shows how many students were forced to drop out of college or forgo it altogether do um, in large part to Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Why do we have some of that data and research and not have the others? Funding. Funding um, determines um, what data lives and what data never even exists. Um, it also has a great deal of influence over what data is collected, how it's collected, and what is allowed to be said about it. Um, there's a fantastic data analyst and artist named Mimi Onuoha, who has an online um, library of missing data sets. I highly recommend you check that out if you're interested in the effect of funding on the existence of data. So the second step that we talk about is motivation. And the motivation step is why is this data project even being done? And um, the explicit and the implicit motivation both have it very powerful, often hidden um, influence over whose worldview is embedded and what power structures are deep within the data project. So if you want to check, check out our tools on that, we can talk about that on another day. Step three is the project design. The project design is the phase where the why becomes the how where you take the money and you take your motivation or all the team's motivation and you operationalize it. And this is a really, really critical step in data equity because this is where you have to make practical decisions. This is where the practical, what data gets collected from who and how are we gonna analyze it and visualize it start to take form. This is where we really, really strongly suggest that if you get to be involved, especially as a data visualization professional, if you get to be involved in the data design step, that you take some time to consider what is the best possible project design. How would you design this project or even design this visualization if you had unlimited resources? Um, if you had to invent a new type of analysis, if your life depended on the outcome. Because often um, your life might not depend on the outcome, but someone's usually does. 
One of the cool things <laughs> that's come out recently in the project design sector is studying up the power chain. So if you're looking to um, work on how to reduce income inequality, maybe instead of studying the poor and wondering how you could nudge them into um, uh, moving up, <laughs> up the gap of income inequality, what would happen if we studied the rich, uh, even the moderately wealthy, and wonder uh, how could we nudge them to close the income inequality gap? Um, maps and the way that studies are designed that um, use geography or any sampling um, based on geography, you do not have to use colonial boundaries. Um, very, very good resources exist at uh, an organization called nativeland.ca where you can um, use pre-colonial boundaries for data collection, for data analysis, and for visualization. That is nativeland.ca. So these kind of things are ways to embed different sets of values, different power structures into your project design phase. Okay, step four is the data collection and sourcing. As data visualization professionals, this probably isn't your main focus, but what does need to be your main focus as a data visualization person is two parts. Um, one, social constructs, and two, data biographies. So it is part of your professional responsibility, in my opinion, <laughs> to be aware of these two things. Um, the first being social constructs, which are sometimes called demographics. Um, but we aren't, of course, born with any of those little boxes checked <laughs> on our little baby bellies. Um, so all of these social constructs, whether they are um, gender or sexual orientation or um, ethnic identity, um, all of these things, Im immigration status, are con socially constructed. And who is constructing them and how? So who's getting to set up the boxes and how they're setting up are very important. And as a data visualization professional, how you're gonna use this is really important. Um, there's a lot of movement lately on being very, very inclusive and collecting very nuanced uh, sex, um, social identity data. An example that we were recently involved in was um, a project that was a survey where people were collecting attitudes about um, how people felt about a certain law. And we consulted with the community and we decided to collect social identity data on sexual orientation. And we included heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, and asexual. Um, this was for um, a Canadian metropolitan center, and this is what the community decided was appropriate. And we're very down for that way of deciding how you're going to construct social identity questions. Ask the community, <laughs> which is great, up until the point that you collect the data. And so now you as a data visualizer may have um, very few respondents in some of these categories. There's a big dilemma between statistical significance and meaning and inclusivity and representation. Um, if you collect very nuanced data and then um, you don't visualize it or report it out in a really nuanced way, people can get mad and hurt that they aren't well represented. Uh, and they can definitely and do feel cheated by being asked detailed questions that you then just combine anyway. So what are you as a data visualizer going to do? Um, there's one option, of course, which is collapsing the communities uh, into boxes that kind of give you sample sizes that you think are, are quote unquote big enough to be meaningful. Um, so in other words, it is possible in the sexual orientation question to put heterosexual people in one box and then everyone else in another box because that gives you nice, in the, our case, it gave us nice big sample sizes in the two boxes. Problem here is that this, this is assigning a person a category that they did not choose. Um, if they did not tick the box called other or even tick the box called not heterosexual, um, Classifying them as other or not heterosexual um, is assigning them an identity that they did not choose. Um, this is very bad for trust. Um, it's 
goes against your intention, if your intention was to be inclusive, um, collecting data in an inclusive way and then analyzing it in an, or visualizing it in a non-inclusive way is fairly problematic in terms of the concept, but it's also really problematic mathematically or statistically because there is very few cases, and our example was certainly not one of those cases, where somebody who checked the asexual box was more similar in their views about this law than somebody who had checked the um, gay box. So those two people were not more similar. In fact, one of those groups was more similar to the heterosexual box checking people than they were to the gay box checking people. So um, I have I kind of thrown away the information of, of the data based on my ideas about the arrangement of sexual orientation. Of course, you have another option. You cannot collapse and simply visualize or analyze the data that you have. However, in our case, we had only um, one person out of our 100 who checked the box that said asexual, and we had only five people who checked the box that said lesbian. And if we're talking about how people feel about a law, we can't really say that one person is representative or speaking for an entire um, community of people who might check that box. So um, we would have to somehow visualize or report very, very wide confidence intervals. So this, there's no easy solution to this. I'm not here to say, oh, I've figured this out. <laughs> um, we're working on this question very, very hard to come up with some options. The best options we have so far are that you need to decide on how you're gonna deal with this before distributing your data collection tool. Um, it is really important not to collect nuanced social identity data that you don't think you're actually going to use. That's kind of performative inclusion <laughs> rather than um, substantial inclusion. And the second suggestion is that you report your results in more than one way. You could actually visualize the collapsed version and the uncollapsed version and several other hybrid perspectives. It is possible to combine people who are similar rather than um, who are who are similar in opinion rather than similar in sexual orientation. And the most important thing is to be transparent about the dilemmas, the compromises, and the choices with your data team, with your survey respondents, and with anybody that's going to see and consume your data. This transparency is really the key to equity. Second part of the data collection phase that's going to matter to you if you're a data visualization person is data biographies. If you are going to visualize data, it is really, really important that you understand exactly where that data came from, that you understand when it was collected, what was actually collected, who it was collected from, why, how, and where. Um, this is, if you might know the term metadata, um, and this Traditional metadata is a great idea, but it's nowhere near in depth enough um, to use data uh, responsibly. I would say at least a good proportion of the equity issues I see in data visualization happens because whoever's doing the visualization made too many assumptions about the biography of the data, what it was actually measuring. I once had um, a variable in a data set that I was working with that was called group gender composition. And the groups um, we were working with were learning groups. Some of them were all female, some of them were all male, some of them were mixed. And um, turns out that the variable group gender composition did not in fact mean uh, who was in the group. Group gender composition was the enumerator or the person collecting the data, their opinion about who in the group was doing the most work. So do not ever <laughs> go by variable names. Variable names are a terrible way to learn anything about your data. And the other terrible thing, uh, a terrible way to learn about data is to simply trust um, the organization or the person that's giving it to you. I work with a lot of incredibly prestigious, well-funded, very trustworthy, very respectable um, people and organizations and um, they give me data that is mislabeled or um, not actually comparing apples to apples, but comparing apples to oranges 
all the time, not intentionally, but all the time. And this um, ends up with some extraordinarily racist, sexist, and colonial results. So one of the real, um, can be time consuming, but worth your effort at a, as a data visualization professional is to um, spend some time understanding what your data actually means. Um, this is a graph that was presented by probably the best funded uh, international organization on intimate partner violence. And um, I was at the conference where this was presented and just my stomach fell when it was presented because I realized that um, this is not, um, these rates of intimate partner violence were not comparing the same things at all. Um, some of these rates um, are counting women of different ages. Some of these ra rates are counting sexual violence. Others are counting only physical violence. Um, some of these data sets are self-reported. Some of them are asked by survey takers. Some are based on police reports. And my concern, the reason my stomach really sank at this conference was wondering whether this chart made it through all the people that approved that, that slide deck because the highest rates were being reported um, among the countries where the most brown women lived. Um, and that we went home and did some work and standardized this data using a data biography tool that you can find on our website if you're interested in doing your own data biographies. Um, and this is what the actual, if we're comparing apples to apples, this is what the actual rates will look like, not like the graph on the left. So um, data biographies are something that you just can't skimp on as a data visualization professional. Okay, um, analysis probably isn't in your job description as a data visualizer, but um, it might be. Maybe um, you're doing a couple of different things. And as a data visualizer, you're often having to do analysis, even if it's in, you're not in your job description. And the way that um, equity issues get embedded in analysis is very, very tricky and often hidden and is a big part of why so many people, so many smart, well-meaning people really do believe that statistics and data are objective. Um, but you almost always um, embed your worldview into any analysis that you're doing. So for example, we worked in a community that had um, a pretty severe youth mental health problem and we were helping them decide where to invest in data. I mean, where to invest in youth support using one data set that this community had. And one group in this community looked at this data and said, okay, who's more at risk, the black youth in our community or the white youth in our community? And they put it into Excel um, which is not a problem, and came up with black youth. So when you compare black youth to white youth in this community, the black youth are m at much greater risk for a mental health issue. Same community, a uh, different group of people, and they had a gender lens. So they took this data and divided it, made an Excel table. Um, who's more at risk, the male youth or the female youth? It's the male youth. The government in this community had a poverty action committee and they broke it out by youth in poverty and youth not in poverty. And they discovered that it was the youth not in poverty that were the most at risk here. And they were like, okay, so it's, um, it's done, right? <laughs> but then they didn't, uh, they called us and we're like, okay, so what, uh, what should we actually do with the money? And we looked at their Excel charts and said, this is great, but each one of you is actually telling the data what to say. Um, we actually need to take all the data you have uh, and look at it in a, in a more nuanced way and not just look at one data issue at a time, but look at the individuals, the young people in your community as multifaceted individuals and do um, build an analysis that reflects the complete lived experience. And what that, uh, that analysis 
told us that it was the white males in poverty that were actually the most at risk. Now, one thing I should emphasize is that this is not a community in the United States and that um, this is one small community several years ago. Um, so this is not a study that is generalizable about youth mental health issues. The purpose of this study and uh, this example is to help you see that the lens through which you do an analysis is the lens that is influencing the results. So if your worldview is um, whether or not the young men or the young women in this community are the most at risk, this is the results that you're gonna come up with, which are correct. I'm not saying that these results are incorrect. These results are correct. If your priority, if the bias that you're in, embedding into this data visualization and analysis is we want to know male youth compared to female youth who's most at risk it's going to be male youth if the worldview that is most important to you is is it youth in poverty or not youth in poverty who's the most at risk it's youth not in poverty however if the question that's most important to you is with a multifaceted lens on our youth, who is the most at risk? It is the white males in poverty. All of these answers are correct, just like the average classroom size. Three and four are correct. It depends on which question you are asking. So when you are even doing something basic like taking an Excel spreadsheet and turning it into charts, you need to be aware and conscious of whose lived experience or what preference or what worldview are you embedding because it your goals will influence how you see the data and how you use the data okay so we've done the first five funding motivation project design data collection and analysis so that's kind of just to set the scene <laughs> to how how you got here you you've already had tons of people's opinions values worldviews perspectives, power dynamics embedded into the data when it shows up on a data visualization person's uh, desk. And you really usually have two main goals, interpretation and then communication distribution. So interpretation is incredibly important. So for example, this is also real data. Um, this is uh, <laughs> the x-axis or the flat axis, the horizontal axis is the average number of cigarettes being consumed per country. And the y-axis or the horizontal axis is the life expectancy per country. And each one of these dots is a country and the white dotted line is a trend line. And so you can do a little bit of math here and figure out that um, there's a very strong, significant, relationship between uh, cigarette consumption and life expectancy. And in fact, um, it's going up. It's a positive relationship. And uh, if we do a little bit of um, refining the way that we're gonna communicate this, so it's in meaningful units, we can um, say that four cigarettes a day is gonna add 10 years to your life. Uh, if we use this data to answer the question, is cigarette smoking good for your health? We can say, why, yes, it is. Four cigarettes a day is going to add 10 years to your life. Again, this is real data. Um, there's no problem with the math. Um, not necessarily a problem with the data viz, depending on what your purpose is. Um, the problem is with the title. Uh, smoking cigarettes, is smoking cigarettes good for your health, is not an interpretation that you can make from this data. Um, this data can only give you the interpretation, uh, do countries with higher average cigarette consumption have longer life expectancies? This data is at the country level. It cannot answer questions about individuals. Um, and it is true, in fact, that countries with higher cigarette consumption do have longer lives. And that's true largely because of money and health systems. <laughs> so, um, the reason that I use this example is that very few people would make a data visualization that says um, smoking cigarettes is good for your health, four cigarettes a day is gonna add 10 years to your life. But the reason you wouldn't <laughs> not is because your lived experience 
just puts up red flags all over the place about that interpretation. However, um, I see charts like this frequently <laughs> because um, it's very easy to accidentally misinterpret the data. So spending time understanding that the first step in taking a data set or results um, and thinking about how you're embedding equity into your data visualization is to think long and hard about how are you interpreting it? Through whose worldview are you interpreting it? Um, and through what set of assumptions? Um, a really uh, kind of well-known example is this compass algorithm that used to be used in several jurisdictions um, by the judicial system to help decide whether or not people would get bail or um, um, parole. And the idea was that the compass algorithm, you feed all this data into this compass algorithm and it gives you a score that predicts how likely it is that this person will reoffend. And that helps the judicial system get efficient and effective about um, whether or not they'll give you parole or bail. You can see from um, just two of the pictures I have here from the ProPublica who did an incredibly good um, in-depth uh, investigative journalism piece about this is that um, Compass, the Compass algorithm is highly racist and very, very problematic. Now, there's a whole bunch of things to say about the Compass algorithm and the problems with it. However, what I'm going to focus on right here is the interpretation. Even if the Compass algorithm was perfect, even if the judicial system was perfect, even if the data being fed into the algorithm was perfect, the Compass score cannot be interpreted as predicting how likely it is that this person will reoffend. What the Compass algorithm is actually doing is giving you a score that predicts how likely it is that this person might come in contact with the police again, be arrested by those police, and not have the money for immediate bail release. So you can see how getting super specific about the interpretation immediately flags a whole bunch of different worldviews and power structures that are being embedded into your interpretation. Um, I have on the We All Count website, um, because this interpretation stage is such an important issue, we have um, a quiz and a bunch of um, checklists to kind of retrain your brain to be able to tell the difference between a quantitative result and an interpretation of a quantitative result, because that's one of the places that people get extremely confused. Um, what's a result and what's an interpretation? Many things that kind of pass themselves off as a result and therefore get visualized or narrated as results are actually interpretations. Okay, so now we're at the big part of the show <laughs> for the DC Data Viz Group. And our seventh step we call communication and distribution. Um, and the distribution part of this um, gets under, under uh, studied or under taught in many, many settings, uh, maybe not some of yours, but in many of them. And if you're gonna do a data visualization or make a report, it's essential that you go through a checklist that thinks about what the equitable distribution of this data project, data report, data visualization is gonna be. And the equitable distribution is a sweet spot that combines content, medium, and access. And you can find um, PDFs of checklists for content, medium, and access from an equity perspective um, on our website. Um, and we can talk more about that later. But essentially, um, content is what you include in your communication. Medium is the form. And access is how easily, completely diverse audiences can engage with and understand your information. And usually you have to make budgetary and time and resource choices about how you're going to combine medium access and content. And one of the big questions that we use at We All Count is who is being prioritized in your combination of content, medium, and access choices. And usually it's the person with the most money or the person with the most power. <laughs> so we recommend you go through the checklist and see how 
you can um, optimize the combination of content, medium, and access using the checklist for maybe not the person with the most money and power, but maybe the part of your potential audience that actually can use and needs this information the most. All right, data visualization. Um, I'm a big fan of ditching dogmatic best practices and instead going for an adaptive user-oriented system. And I really learned this a lot by um, living and working in Bangladesh and um, also um, Rwanda and Tanzania. Because of course I was fresh out of grad school, had my whole pack of data viz books, which I love, written by people who I like a lot and um, pretty quickly fell flat on my face in the types of data visualization that I was trying to produce for um, just, for example, um, those women in Bangladesh um, that were trying to get more dairy milk out of their cows that we saw at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, and many of the things that I had been taught were best practices in data viz um, just didn't work for them at all. And many of the things that I thought were, that I was taught were, were horrible and would kind of get screamed at on data viz Twitter for doing um, were actually very effective in rural Bangladesh. Um, and then I started to kind of dig a little deeper when I um, started publishing We All Count pieces and realized that the vast majority of kind of cognitive data viz best practices, peer reviewed published research, um, in 2016, the top 30 articles in that sector, the top 30 most quoted articles, 80% um, of those articles only included their research subjects, so the, the testing that they did, only included um, people from Canada, the United States, and occasionally Western Europe. And 75% of that included um, people from those countries that were attending or had very recently attended university. So um, we, we are now conducting our own set of um, RCTs um, that we've been doing longitudinally for the past three and a half years in um, five countries in the global south. And we are just about to produce um, some southern hemisphere as <laughs> best practices, not with the intention of setting up some new dogma, but of saying um, this actually really, really matters. Um, here's a fantastic example that was published recently in Nature, and um, it's by the um, No Bullshit guys running that community, uh, co that college online, university online course. Um, and what they did, which I thought was brilliant, and it really shows how deeply worldviews are embedded into data visualization was they took just a typical kind of scatter plot, you know, a change in fertility rate on the vertical axis, change in housing price on the, uh, oh, on the vertical axis, change in fertility rate on the horizontal axis. The flat line is change in fertility rate. The up and down line is change in housing price. And one of the problems is that we're really used to seeing in Canada and North America, a certain education level, we're really used to seeing these. And we're really used to associating the idea that um, oftentimes the, the independent variable or the thing that's kind of being controlled is on the flat axis. And the dependent variable or the thing that's changing as a result of our control is on that up and down axis, which often leads people to mistake correlation for causation. So what these two did was they turned it on its side into something they're calling a diamond plot. And they're now out there um, actually doing some peer reviewed literature on how people interpret this. But the initial idea was people will stop mistaking correlation for causation if we do something like this. Now that's very interesting to me, but it, what's really interesting to me is that it illustrates that this idea that the axes need to be horizontal or vertical or even straight even linear, like, is, is a deeply embedded worldview. It's a choice. It's a habit. It's not representative of anything that's real or objective. This is how deeply um, worldviews, value systems, habits are embedded into data visualization. 
and I love this diamond chart. <laughs> um, color is probably something that you've already heard a lot about in the data visualization sector, but something as simple as red um, means dozens and dozens and dozens of different things. Um, it can mean happiness, it can mean joy, it can mean prosperity, it can mean death, it can mean blood, it can mean um, genocide. So it's vital as a data visualization professional to spend time understanding what the specific color meanings are, as well as things like um, what's the shape of time? What's the shape of power? Um, what's the shape of, um, excuse me, what's the shape of time? What's the shape of power? What's the shape of um, individual versus communal relationships? in the lived experiences of the people that you're trying to communicate with. Um, this is a calendar that is um, very, very meaningful and nonlinear to the group of people that developed it and still use it because their belief is that time is nonlinear. Um, the belief that I was raised in, of course, is that time is linear and I wouldn't draw a calendar like this, but my belief that or not even my belief, my habitual way of thinking that time is linear is not more correct than this belief or this way of visualizing time. Um, so it's very easy in creating a data visualization to accidentally um, reproduce your worldview, your embedded power structure with the belief that it's objective. Um, this is a project that we did with a school board that was having um, a lot of trouble for a very good reason, um, communicating the ways in which students were being um, disciplined. And they had a bunch of students in their school and they needed to fulfill certain types of regulations and communicate whether or not they were um, suspending these students equitably, whether students were being treated fairly. So we went in and tried to help them develop some analysis and some visualization and communication materials that would um, not exacerbate the feelings of oppression and um, unfairness and mistreatment that existed within certain uh, students and their parents in the broader community. So here is a quick example of the school um, one of the problems right away <laughs> is the use of um, the dresses and the not dresses. Um, that's probably on its way out for good reason. Um, secondly, they um, had three groups of students that they needed to report about, and um, they were three um, different ethnic groups. Um, and again, using color to represent ethnic groups is also probably no longer a best practice for very good reasons. And what was happening at the school was that different, different ethnic groups, students of different ethnic groups were getting suspended at different rates. And the school was trying to understand, A, how to hold themselves accountable for this fact, B, how to communicate this fact for reporting purposes, and um, C, what to do about it. So um, one of their first attempts to not be racist was to um, make a chart that compared the rates of students who experienced one suspension or more divided by racial or ethnic group. Um, this was very unsuccessful because as we saw from before, it kind of grouped two people, white students and not white students. And what this did was immediately send a message um, that the white students were the baseline and everybody else was the other. Uh, also, as we talked about, mathematically not great. <laughs> um, so then they thought, okay, maybe we're going to add um, some colors to show um, who in which ethnic group is in the non-white section. Uh, this is still um, not a good way to embed equity in a chart. <laughs> so. One of the things um, that we did when we were working with this school district and working um, directly with community leaders and parents was we started to ask, okay, how, does it see, how would it seem fair to you that this data would get reported out? 
And one of the things they wanted was that most communities do usually want is they wanted the categories to be way more specific, not lumped into white and not white. Um, and the community themselves decided that they wanted um, these six categories. So we started to make these charts. This is um, the rate of students who have never been suspended, divided by racial or ethnic group. Um, so this is a good start. So each, each of these bars here represents the percentage of students within that group who have never been suspended. And one of the problems here, one of the ways that um, a worldview or racism is being embedded into this chart is this white line that says 74% overall students never suspended. The reason that that average line there is a problem is because this chart hides the fact that the vast majority of students or the, not the vast majority, but the majority of students in this school are white students, are one type of student. And that means the average is largely going to be influenced by the experience of the majority of students, whatever color they are. The average is going to be um, essentially a representation of the lived experience of the white students in this school. So to put that average line and label it as overall, is embedding a certain degree of racism. So we tried to correct that um, by comparing two compositions. This is very, very common. We see this kind of chart frequently <laughs> in peer-reviewed academic literature. So um, we're not gonna really talk about whether the data is as good or not, but the, the idea that we would visualize um, one bar, the dark bar, that's the composition of student enrollment, and then the light bar, which is the composition of students that were suspended, is, is a good start because this adds in the information that was missing from the chart just before. And um, we can see that um, we can compare what percentage of the student body is made up of each one of these ethnic groups with what percentage of the, student of the suspended student body is made up of each of these ethnic groups. Now the problem with this chart is that this chart accidentally has two scales. The scale of the light bar is all, is the scale of the dark bar is all students. The scale of the light bar is only suspended students. So it actually makes the, um, the relative ratios be greatly exaggerated. This is what happens when you actually put these two bars on the same scale. So you can see the difference between this and this. It's much less embedded with a relative problem by comparing um, the white kids with all of the other kids. This one is the closest that we've gotten so far in giving an accurate representation of, okay, um, how many students are in the school and how many students are getting suspended. So this with, with the parent group and the community leader group was the closest we got. And then we started to talk about um, the wording. Right now we have the proportion of the student group who were suspended and the portion of the group in the student population. Um, what if, instead of using the narrative around the data viz to um, kind of put the onus on the students, we say the portion of the student group the administration chose to suspend instead of the proportion of the student group who were suspended. This dramatically changes um, the onus. It embeds an entirely different um, power dynamic and um, immediately had the effect on the community of um, highlighting the fact that there were structural issues at work. So this is the way that you can embed a different power structure or a different worldview into um, something as simple as a bar chart. Now a data, a data visualization professional can 
definitely improve on the bar chart, but the ideas need to remain the same. Um, okay, so the very last thing I'm going to talk about is, um, oops, I skipped two slides, sorry about that, is the idea of um, our number one tool to understand what exactly what exact worldviews and assumptions and power dynamics are being embedded into your data viz? Because it's very hard to get a hold of this. It is something that we call um, the equity legend. So, for example, this map has no meaning to you at all if you are not um, trained and skilled and practiced at really reading these maps. The way that you get understanding, like what are these squiggly blue lines? What are these um, red dots? Why are some of the red numbers little, like one? Why, and some of them are huge, like 4,800. You get that with a legend. And I am aware <laughs> that it's very good practice to include a visual legend on any public facing um, data viz. And so we wanna take that best practice and kind of run with it. Take, take a tool that people are already um, trained or learning how to use and really go deep with it. And we recommend that every time you make a data viz at all, internally, either yourself or with your team, you go through and you make a very thick data viz legend. Just like we have a data biography process that's much more in depth than a traditional kind of metadata, we have a data visualization legend tool that's much deeper than kind of a traditional forward-facing legend. And you go through your data viz and you specifically look at um, each of these elements, talk about what do they represent and why did you choose it. And we have found over and over and over that this helps the designer understand what perspectives, what power dynamics, whose worldview is being embedded. Um, I'm going to look at a really quick example. So we have lots of time for questions and um, we're going to take the topic of garbage being collected because that's not um, um, Most places have some kind of garbage. <laughs> it's not geographically specific. Um, so this is just put into Excel um, and a simple line graph. This is the tons of garbage that are collected in each of these months. So we walk through, what do the colors mean? Why is that line orange? That line is orange, um, frankly, because the default settings on my computer are my brand settings and that orange and purple are my brand colors. <laughs> um, the shapes, what do the sh shapes mean? Um, well, so we're using a bunch of different shapes in this visualization. We're using circles, we're using a line, um, what do they mean? Am I using that circle intentionally? Whose worldview is embedded in that circle? Who is accustomed to seeing those circles? Um, or is there a different kind of shape that would be more meaningful to the audience that I'm trying to communicate with that would um, reflect the lived experience of the audience that I'm trying to communicate with? You go through each one of these things. The axis is really important here because as we talked about, this has a very Western, very traditional two straight lines for axes. It has time as a left to right horizontal and um, many, many cultures, not, not just like some obscure or a couple of people living on an island, many cultures do not view time as a left to right straight line. Um, and if you're trying to communicate with communities in any country um, that don't view time as left to right as a straight line, this might be an accidentally racist, inappropriate um, visualization that centers your lived experience rather than the way of thinking that is um, most accessible to the group of people that you're trying to communicate with. Here's another visualization of the very same data. Um, so this, this visualization is designed for an entirely different purpose and audience. And again, before it goes public, we go through each one of these uh, legend steps and say, okay, what does this mean? The colors, what do the colors mean? In this case, the colors um, are designed to represent seasons. Um, the group of people that this data viz was designed for are very um, regular users of these four colors to mean the four seasons. Uh, the shapes, 
The shapes are circles and that's also specifically designed for the community that's going to interpret it. The axis here is a circular axis because this community does view time as a cycle. Um, and the size here is representative of tons. Now that's incredibly controversial, whether you should use a circle or not to represent size because humans can't perceive of that. It really depends on the purpose and the community um, that you are designing for. So I'm not saying this is right or better than the other one. I'm saying the way that we embed an equity lens is we walk through each one of these legend items spend a long time thinking about why we've chosen each one of the elements in this legend and what it means. And if, if we like them, if we like the colors, if we like the shapes, if we like the scales, we go with it. If we don't, that's our opportunity to make an adjustment. Um, same data, <laughs> very different um, visualization here for a very different community and purpose. And again, we walk through each one of these scales. Um, this is a totally different color scheme um, designed for a very different purpose. Um, and you know, you, you are data visualization professionals. You can walk through each one of these. We are using a pattern, a very specific pattern here that's specifically designed um, to speak to the group of people that this, um, this is designed for. Although when we did this, when we went through this legend recently, we decided that we didn't like the thin white lines that are separating each of the months. So um, we didn't like the way we were displaying the axis in this case, those thin white lines, because this community did not really see those lines as those months as separate because this visualization is designed to illustrate the cumulative um, growth and impact of these tons of garbage. So we actually, after making the most recent version of this legend, we changed to make it more appropriate, less appropriate for us, because we are very accustomed to those lines, more appropriate for the community. So we have found that the legend is the most effective way that we have found, the most effective tool that we have found to help walk through a data visualization where we're so used to embedding um, our habits and our um, externally given best practices. And the legend allows you to do a couple of things. It allows you to raise a whole bunch of red flags about things that might be arbitrary or habitual that you could actually change to embed a different power dynamic or a different worldview in your data viz. And it also helps with the cultural translation. It helps you understand the symbol choices. Do the colors, icons, shapes, and images mean what you want them to mean to your audience? Does the structure of your visualization resonate with how your audience sees your data? How, why does this even matter for equity? And the reason this matters for equity is that it is incredible. The reason that we love data visualization is that it's so powerful. It, it gets past a whole bunch of cognitive and mental gatekeepers and gets directly into a person's kind of subconscious. That's why data viz is so powerful and people love it. Um, however, the same reason is the, the same reason it's so easy to accidentally embed all kinds of worldviews that you are not meaning to embed. And this is an example I'm going to leave you with. And this is a really, really common example. Um, if you've done any work in sociology or psychology or taken a class on the difference between equity and equality. If you Google that, if you put into Google images, um, equity versus equality, this is basically the image that you're going to get. Um, and the, the illustration, the data visualization here is we have three people, three different heights, trying to see over a fence. If we treat these people equally, we give them each a box and um, it doesn't really help with people's ability to see over the fence, to fulfill their potential and overcome the barriers because the tall person can still see over the fence and they always could. And the short person on the right still can't see over the fence. So treating people equally, which is giving them all the exact same thing, is, is not, in this textbook, usually um, the best idea. So in fact, 
the textbook really likes equity and equity is where you give people what they need. The person on the left who doesn't need any boxes to overcome the barrier, see over the fence, he gets no boxes. The person on the right who's the shortest, he gets two boxes because he needs the most support to see over the fence to overcome the barrier. This is well intentioned and has lived for decades, decades and decades in textbooks. Problem here is that it is deeply embedded with racist, sexist, and colonial ideas in the images. First of all, by, by designing the icons to visualize um, the heights of the people to signify um, their potential or their ability to see, um, immediately sends the message that it is in, intrinsic to the person, that the person is born with these differences, that these um, different potentials are inborn and um, personal individual attributes of the person. Second problem is that this idea that they're all facing this barrier that's the same size. They're, we're all just trying to get over this barrier and the barrier's the same size. That is not anyone's lived experience. Um, the barriers are very different <laughs> depending on uh, who you are. And so instead of visualizing um, one barrier that's all the same, that people that are intrinsically different have different heights, different potentials are trying to see over, we've switched it around by using a legend to understand where we were using icons, patterns, and symbols to represent things that were deeply embedded with a worldview that we were trying to overcome. And we now visualize it as the people are all the same height, but the barriers that they're facing are really, really different. And the context in which they find themselves, the height of the land in which they're standing is also really different. And that this is in fact equity where um, we remove the barriers <laughs> and we fill in the ground. Um, and one of the reasons that this idea about equity is more challenging than the original is that it's a lot easier to give a short person two boxes to stand on than it is to actually dismantle structural <laughs> barriers and actually bring about equity. So um, we couldn't have gotten to the understanding of this visual without carefully walking through our legends. Um, with the legend, we broke it down. We looked with intention at each element so we could see equity issues that we haven't even thought of. And that's the purpose of We All Count. That's the philosophy of how to embed equity in a data project through all the steps. Look with intention at each one of the steps and um, you'll see equity issues that you haven't even thought of because it's very hard to get kind of outside of your own mind. Um, and that it's worth doing it every part of the data cycle. But if your job is to only work at one part, um, it's great to be aware of the other steps of the data equity framework, but there's always tons and tons you can do wherever you find yourself situated along these seven steps. Um, and I know I've gone, <laughs> covered tons of material extremely quickly. Um, and so I'm gonna give you here the place to find me, to find all these tools, to find a lot of these slides, weallcount.com. Um, this is just the tiniest little taste <laughs> of the things that I'm passionate about, the things that we're working on. Um, so weallcount.com is kind of a hub where people are sharing their stories, um, people are sharing tools, we are piloting different tools. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to get involved. If you want to email me, heather at idatasys.com, if I've um, confused you in any way <laughs> or you have ideas that you'd like to share, um, we always are looking for lots of people to um, share their own stories, share their tools. We're certainly not, we all count is not an organization or a project to say, we've got this all figured out, here's the tools, it's fixed. Um, we all count is a place to say um, we have some very deep equity issues in data. We're trying to figure out the right questions to ask and we're trying to test tools as fast as we can um, to help people achieve um, their version of equity. So thank you for having me. I felt like it went by so fast. <laughs> 
I great with so many great comments though. We've got great questions going on in the uh, chat box, also in the Q and A. I'm actually going to tee up a quick slide for those of you who are hanging out with us. I've added. Uh, I've gone ahead and I've added Heather's contact info just in case you didn't have a chance to grab it down. But I do want to just quickly flag that we would love your feedback if you have any. Um, we love getting feedback on these sessions, even if you're coming to us from not DC. So as before we launch into Q&A, feel free to go ahead and hop on this Menti poll. Go to menti.com and use this six digit code 782998, again, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and use the code 782998. We'll share the feedback that you give us there also with Heather, because we always love going ahead and giving data back to our speakers. <laughs> Um, but with that, I want to be mindful of all the different interesting questions that we have here today in terms of things that we could look at. So I'll leave this up. Uh, first question, there are so many good ones. Uh, there are a couple of very specific ones, Heather. So for the gap in the three ethnic sectors at the very yeah. beginning, was this a pre-post-test or a gap analysis? Or could you share a bit more about the methods? Someone wants to know a bit about the weeds. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, no, it, it wasn't an experiment at all. Um, it was simply um, an analyzing administrative data. All right, great. Um, in terms of looking at audiences, um, Sunia asked, do you have concerns about audiences focusing on a new visual representation instead of the point you're trying to make when we use more creative forms of visualizations? Um, I am not that concerned with that. Um, I am concerned with that within the data visualization community itself, but I am not concerned about that in audiences that aren't the data visualization community themselves. People are in, extremely hungry for information they can use accurately and quickly, and um, they're a lot less concerned about style than we ourselves are. <laughs> Fair point. Um, Susanna asked, does the composition of students who were suspended, in one of your earlier examples, represent unduplicated numbers of students? Yes. Excellent. Um, broader, <laughs> these are very specific questions. I know. I was like, these are some of those ones that are like, we don't want to disrupt the flow, but also they probably are ones no. that were quickly, quickly answer there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so I think there are, there are a, couple of, a couple of questions uh, that are, I think, are a little bit uh, less specific, mm -hmm. um, really around um, sort of intersectional critiques mm -hmm. and figuring out how, you know, when can you be reasonably confident that you've got the entire picture and you're not really leaving any groups out? Never. Um, you can never be confident that you have got the entire picture. And I think that's the number one thing. That's the same thing as you should never say your data is objective. Um, mm. And you should never say you have the entire picture. Um, I think a lot of people come to me and say, can you help me make my data bulletproof? Um, can you make sure that I, that I have got it, that I have got it unbiased and objective and unassailable? And mm. I say that is a great desire and unfortunately no. Um, and that anybody is selling you a consulting service that says yes um, is, does not understand. <laughs> um, and that the closest to bulletproof a data project or a data visualization can get is to be intentional and transparent. Um, and I think that especially in the current climate, there's this feeling that being transparent makes us vulnerable and, um, you know, people say to me, you know, how, how can you possibly feel good about yourself if you go out into the world and, and say data is not objective because you're actually fueling the climate change denier fire or fill in whatever fire you don't like. Um, and I say, actually, I think that the lack of scientists doing that is what's fueling the climate change deniers <laughs> or fill in the blank is that um, our lack of transparency about um, all the complexity and, and the fact that we are never displaying <laughs> the full picture um, is what has actually is, is, is our part in that responsibility. I don't think it's the whole part. I don't think, but it's, it's the part that we've done, the scientists. So uh, we had someone pop in who, who told us that they're actually joining us from South Africa or from Zimbabwe. I may have missed that, but from across, across the world. And given that, I want to flag it's, this it question. It must be the middle of the so night for you. It is. So um, <laughs> in your study of data viz in different cultural settings, yes. 
Are you looking also at how well Gestalt principles hold up in different settings? So for example, is judging the length of an arc easier for cultures that visualize time as circular? I know as given that my background's also in international development and we had lots of chatter, I think people would love to know just a bit more about what to expect from this study that's not about white psych students who are doing the (laughs) test and telling us what they think about different visual sites. You don't want to know what the the students at. It actually is like five universities. University of Toronto is one of them um, over right beside me. Um, Yes. So what we're, we are, it's a multi, um, like a multi-prong study. And what we're trying to do is cover all of the bases, um, including exactly that, the Gestalt thing, like, um, is it actually easier for um, somebody who thinks of time as linear to read a donut chart than it is for them to read that straight line chart. Mm. Um, As well as um, switching the goal to be from accuracy to understanding, which I know is is already widely discussed. I'm not not saying I'm the first person that thought of that. That's that's being widely discussed in the native visualization community about, um, you know, Mona Chalabi is an amazing example of that, of, you know, we should stop pretending <laughs> that we know anybody's opinion within 0.1% or whatever and, um, and communi- visualize um, uncertainty, but uncertainty is a big word. Mm. So, so yes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm really excited to read that paper whenever it comes out. Yeah, uh, it's, it's on the way. <laughs> uh, there are a couple others, uh, more detailed questions about some of these variable naming conventions. Um, yeah. uh, John Schwabish asked, I'm curious how you think about <laughs> listing demographic variable names and regression tables and graphs as well, since most people will list demographics in the order they appear in the data, like white, black, Hispanic, Asian, other. How should we rethink how we order these and similar categories? Yes. Okay. So there are so many different questions in that question. Um, the mention of regression tables just gives me, you know, makes my teeth hurt. Um, as a data scientist, um, I would love to never see a regression table again outside of its appropriate context, which is like um, the appendix of a peer reviewed journal article, um, because it's actually almost impossible to get any meaningful information out of a regression table. And that includes by mathematical statisticians, like, (laughs) but that's a whole other thing that we could talk about for hours later. Um, But in any kind of report, when you're reporting out demographics, um, I do think that um, the priorities are reporting it in a way that doesn't accidentally set up one group of people, whether it's sexual orientation, race, immigration status, as the baseline or the normal. Um, one thing is if you, have to, if you have to break it out in different ways, um, it's always better to compare, um, compare apples to apples. So that average, the average is almost never the average. Never report an average unless you have actually kind of weighted it by the people that exist in that in that community. Like a naive average is the fastest way to be normalization of the existing power structure. Naive average. I'm gonna have to mute. That. <laughs> that um, I want to step back from the regressions maybe into a question that we got about that might be relevant to more folks, right? How do you accommodate taking the time to think about all these really important issues in data viz when we're also all underneath deadlines to deliver insights on projects, to produce that next piece of data journalism? Um, the asker asks, uh, I want to make thinking about bias a part of my daily analysis habit and would love any suggestions on incorporating this into my life. Okay, so I love this question. Thank you for asking it because this time pressure is a result of white supremacy, (laughs) right? Like the reason you're under this kind of time pressure is not natural or normal or a given. There are people, individuals, and cultures all over the world that would never rush to produce something that they hadn't had time to think about. Especially, I mean, if we even just take the coronavirus, like the giant amount of data that's being visualized at a speed that's 
way, way, way faster than anybody understands that data, um, is being driven in large part by white supremacy. So this is the problem, um, is that it's very hard to embed equity in something external like a data viz without taking the time to embed equity in yourself and your life. And that's the rub. And so it is gonna create stress. Like I'm not gonna paint some picture to be like, oh, just do this and it's not gonna be stressful. It is gonna be stressful. Um, and it's, you know, kind of part of the way out. Um, but um, having said that, um, there are a couple of kind of um, shortcuts to kind of at least get you that first thing. Like you, if you're still gonna work at your job, like I'm unemployable, right? But if you, if you would like to remain unemployed, um, then uh, you probably do have to um, produce the things. And a couple of things um, in, in any narrative that's surrounding your data is at all, any words, check the verbs, absolutely check the verbs. Um, who is being put in a position of power in the verbs. Um, second thing is in your data visualization, check the denominators. The number one thing to understand who, whose power is being embedded in your data viz is to check the denominator. Who is actually getting to be counted as the foundation, the normal, the baseline um, in your data viz. The third thing is if you still have time, like that might've taken you the only 15 minutes that you have, but if you still have another five minutes, um, check exactly what um, William just asked, which is how can you express who's not included? Mm. Or, and we, go ahead, I can talk for yeah, hours. There is a, a, I think that's a great segue into another question, which is how do we get leaders within white dominated spaces yeah. on board with equitable ways of presenting data? How do we get that buy-in? Okay, so that's a slide I skipped for time, but let me tell you, <laughs> when you get the slide deck, it'll be in there. Okay, so the number one thing about anti-racism, equity and ethics in your data projects, the, the only kind of semi-true criticism that I ever get is that, Heather, these practices are not anything to do with equity and ethics. These are just best practices in data science and data visualization, and that is true. <laughs> So, so what you want to tell your boss who might be a white supremacist is this is how you, A, your results are more accurate, B, your results are more truthful, C, your data processes get more efficient because if you go through the whole data framework process, you end up with a really great, solid, very efficient um, data pipeline. Um, C, I don't know, five, what number am I on? <laughs> Next um, is um, you need to protect your brand. Like if you aren't doing equitable and ethical um, data visualization, um, you are going to get called out. If it's not today, if it's not five years ago, it's going to be tomorrow. And it's so much easier to proactively um, build trust, proactively um, ensure that you're investing in your brand than it is to clean up the mess. And the example I use here is climate change. Um, 10 years ago, any corporation, like corporations were dumping chemicals into, into creeks. They didn't care. They were just making money. And now it's super important for your corporate social responsibility or your government um, social responsibility or even your nonprofit or your impact investing firm to like lay out in your annual general report, like this is your ESA or this is your um, social, you know, this is all the ways that you're sustainable and that you're, you know, not dumping chemicals into the water and stuff. But in the next five to 10 years, that's gonna be the standard for ethics in equity in the way that you use your data. So get ahead of the game, do it now. That's my pitch for why you should do this even if you're a white supremacist. <laughs> so we've had a couple different questions tackle and look at the issues around intersectionality and the complexity of displaying data and especially visualizations. Uh, one comment uh, indicated that a difficult impediment we face is that our universe usually limits us to two dimensions. And it's not always feasible to simply add a bar or a line plot for each subgroup to that 2D plane. Um, other folks were talking about other creative approaches to that. How do you add more insider information with some of these other more kind of advanced creative things like sonification? 
communication or animation, which also themselves may have accessibility constraints. Right. So kind of packaging a lot of those different questions around this challenge of we're asked to create simple, impactful, compelling visualizations that are easy to understand, you know, can kind of see the story right there. But at the same time, there's so much complexity that gets lost in that sometimes. So how do you balance that? And what, right. are, what are some of the best practices you would recommend? Yeah, so I have a lot more um, examples and tools than I had time to share today that do address some of those things at much greater depth. And um, one of the first things though that I would say is when you're, I mean, you're always gonna have to make trade-offs, right? Um, you can't make 25 products that are ideally designed for 25 different types of people. Very few people have the time and the, the um, resources for that. But what tends to happen is when you're making those decisions, do you include the animation or not? Um, do you include that third dimension or not? Do you include the complexity of an intersectional analysis or not? Um, the habits are to prioritize the people with the most power and the most money when you make those trade-offs. We're, we're always gonna have to make trade-offs as data visualization professionals, but do we always have to make trade-offs that prioritize the people with the most prestige? Um, maybe, maybe we do, like if your purpose and mission is to you know, get some award or whatever, then yeah, you need to prioritize that. But if your um, purpose is instead and, and I'm not saying that's a bad purpose. I'm saying you need to be very clear. That's why we spend a lot of time on motivation, the motivation statement. Why exactly? What's the motivation here? Um, and to get really, really honest about what your motivation is. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's how you avoid one of the questions that I'm sure somebody's asking is, isn't this all just performative? Um, and it is. If your motivation is, number one is, um, you know, X, it's very likely <laughs> that this is all performative. Um, but if your motivation is different, um, that's how you tell whether it's performative or not. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the ways. Um, so the, that's the first thing in terms of making trade-offs. The second thing is I think that that blue sky step in the project design is something that I'd spend a lot of time on um, because what we often see as givens or the constraints that require us to choose are often um, not real restraints. They are restraints that are being applied to our data visualization because we are in a certain mindset, because we have been to a certain school, because we have seen all the data visualizations that look this way, you know, that, that a scatter plot has a, you know, that it's shaped like a rectangle, not like a diamond. <laughs> I mean, um, so a lot of the choices that feel like trade-offs are actually false choices if you step back and really spend some time on that blue sky part of your design. Um, you'll find that a lot of what seems necessary or a given is actually um, a, a power dynamic, a cultural habit, an educational habit, a communal assumption, not necessarily an actual constraint. So much to think about. Uh, one of the ways I know a lot of people learn, and, and we've had yeah. a couple questions on this, is around case studies and examples. So can I, questions here around, do you have case studies for design interventions or more kind of before, or before and after visualizations that show how visualizations were remade to bring in this equity lens? Where can someone go to find those resources? Yes, so the place to go to find those resources is weallcount.com. And um, the short answer is yes, we do have more before and, and afters. And um, we do have a number of, um, as Amanda was talking about at the beginning, a much more, a set of much more in-depth workshops, like seven, 10 hour workshops on each one of the steps. So there's a whole day that we do only on communication and, and data visualization um, that do share a lot of case studies. One of the things that we really need and are actively working on is a lot of people are afraid to share their befores <laughs> because of, you know, data viz Twitter can be a mean place. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, we are actively working on some anonymous case studies that should be out um, definitely this summer um, that 
actually walk through I, those legends that I talked about um, that walk mm. through each step. And one of them is that school one. Um, we just have to, there's all, there's a lot of red tape. You got to get approval from before you can show a school <laughs> this, but, but the answer is keep, keep your eyes on weallcount.com. And if you are here at this webinar and you have examples that you would like to share, um, absolutely email me because it's, it's not, you know, it's not my space. It's a, it's a hub. Yeah, so that's, on the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Will. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, there, just to follow up on that, we had a couple of people ask about you know, who else, in addition to yourself, should, should people follow if, if we're interested in this space? Are there any other great thinkers that you'd love to give shout outs to? Absolutely. Um, Amanda is a great thinker <laughs> in this space that I, would, that I would absolutely give a shout out to. I don't know the rest of you, Will, Benjamin, and Abby, but I'm sure you're fantastic too. I noticed that your Twitter, handle, Twitter handles are really great. <laughs> I was jealous of your, but really, seriously, all joking aside, Amanda is absolutely one of my go-to people. Um, Stephanie Evergreen is also great. Um, she has some really good stuff on her website that um, she has a really good example about maps and the way to um, maybe to or not to represent um, people in a map. Um, mm which I really like. I am always watching, uh, reading everything that Stephanie Evergreen produces. Um, Alberto Cairo, um, good friend of mine, um, you know, full disclosure, um, has a book called How Charts Lie, <laughs> which, um, yeah, a, a, good, good rep, a good reference. Um, he's employable, so he doesn't always go quite as far <laughs> as I'd like. Um, also a very cool woman named um, Jara Dean Coffey, out in um, the west coast of the United States is um, running something called the Equitable Evaluation Initiative. And they are producing some very interesting materials about um, how to avoid using data and visualizing data like a racist. I should have prepared better for this question because I should have known it was coming and um, I'm not doing a very, comprehensive job of answering it. So I would like to say when I send around some written questions and answers, I want to give, oh, oh, I know. Okay. Okay. Um, anything that you can find about design justice. Um, so Toronto has a fantastic design justice league, but there is definitely also one in Chicago that I've been to. Um, and I think there's also, yes, there's also one in San Francisco that I've been to. So um, design, the design justice folks, aren't focused on data viz, but the ideas that they're developing are fantastic and immediately applicable to this. And there's a book called This Is Not an Atlas, which is a fantastic book, which I highly recommend about maps. And again, there's so many people I, I'm sure I've missed. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, I think that kind of rounding up some recommendations and having them uh, shared with folks so that they can yeah. click and find folks. I know sometimes it's just the guessing on the spelling of the name can be tricky. So we'll make yeah. sure that we share out those kind of resources. Absolutely. Absolutely. When, um, I, when I write back the q and I'll do a much better job at answering that question. Totally fine. <laughs> um, I'm mindful that we're kind of wrapping up in our last kind of 15 minute window that we'd booked for this time. So we'll keep going with questions while we've got them. We've still got 311 folks hanging on. <laughs> Um, happy to keep going with these. There's a few different ones around different best practices. So this idea of kind of resources on research of data best practices around the intersectionality, um, ideas around how to use color gradients effectively, and I think more specifically here, how we use color to represent race. So on some of these specific kind of questions about how we can be more mindful in our design choices, do you have yeah. any specific recommendations or places people should be looking to learn more? Um, these are really, really hard questions and, um, I don't have, I don't have a one-stop shop cause that's why I'm trying to build a one-stop shop. <laughs> um, not because my ideas are the one stop, but I'm trying to kind of bring together <laughs> as many ideas as I can find. Um, so, um, I would not rec recommend representing race with color. Um, I think it's just generally a very bad idea and, um, we are collectively smart enough to figure out something else. Now, have I figured out something else? Uh, no. <laughs> and I'm certainly not an expert on things like color gradients and um, things like that. People, there are people probably on this call that are, you know, 
orders of magnitude better qualified to talk about um, things like color gradient. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, we have gotten rid of representing race with color or um, gender with shape. Um, what we're using instead is just different icons or different shapes. It's interesting because um, Catherine had a follow-up question that relates to that around the figures that you presented in the equity illustration. And would they be more effective if they were not recognizable as typical human race, ethnicities, or genders, and really kind of be yeah. more impactful if they didn't even register as members of any one familiar group? Yeah, and um, that's really hard. Um, it's really hard because of what I do actually think is a, a bit of a hard wiring in the human brain. We're really trying to, to conduct experiments around that because that I'm so happy that you brought up this question um, because we do want them represented as humans. Mm. And the thing about humans is that we're, we're trained to immediately start assigning social identities to people. And, and that's partly because we are um, kind of pod people <laughs> by nature, like humans need, as, as the coronavirus has demonstrated us, humans need other humans to survive. We are designed to be parts of groups of people. And so immediately we're, we're putting people into groups. Um, and so that's part, part of why we're doing that. And the other part of why we're doing that is racism. <laughs> and so um, sorting out the threads, like untying a knot, right? Like we're, we're basically trying to untie this big knot that we got ourselves into. <laughs> yeah. So if you, have, if you have an idea of how to design those people, humans, better, I would be thrilled to see it. Like genuinely make my month. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a sort of interesting question come up that looks at that the same you know, cycle that we've gotten ourselves stuck in but not from the the social perspective but from the tools and platform perspectives a lot of a lot of the defaults of our tooling shapes how we make our visualizations uh the question is are there any particular software or programs that lend themselves particularly well to breaking outside of the existing white supremacist and colonist or colonialist visual norms yeah so here's the problem it's super hard to break out of colonialism white supremacy with tools built by white supremacists and colonialists that's super super hard <laughs> so yeah i'm super down that this is a problem um however it's not impossible um and i think again um i think that it's a reasonable place to start by using the tools that you have checking your verbs checking your baselines checking um the the power dynamic that is being embedded into your data viz and embedded into the way that you communicate and even if you can't build a new tool um, figure out how to use the tool as in a is in as revolutionary a way as possible <laughs> for example um if in fact this is true that all those K-pop kids brought down Trump's rally with Twitter, that is a great example. I don't know if that's true. Um, it doesn't even really matter if you're pro or con Trump, but Twitter is absolutely an example of a white supremacist capitalist tool. <laughs> and if that happened, that's a good example of a way that you can use a white supremacist tool to um, subvert um, who it might be benefiting. Um, so you can absolutely do the same thing. I like tools personally that are um, as unrestrictive as possible. I mean, I like things where I can program directly or draw directly, but I wouldn't prescribe that as a universally correct thing. I'm pretty sure that's just me. I'm pretty sure like something super prescriptive like Tableau or whatever is just as good. I just don't know how to use it as well. Well, and that's a great question. I think more broadly for folks, if you have thoughts in the chat, if you're still hanging out with us, feel free to go ahead and answer yeah. some ideas on that on tools. Because I think the data viz tool stack is wide and varied depending on what your background is. If you're someone in evaluation and social science, you might be much more uh, in tune with using Excel and Stata uh, versus someone who comes from an economics background who did all their grad school research in R. 
So I think that Precisely. there's a lot of variance in terms of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. We welcome folks to chime in there too, since, I mean, we're only three of many people who could give you very strong opinions about which tool we like to use. Right. Um, and, and we're specifically trying to be tool agnostic for that exact yeah. reason. Yeah. I mean, all of these ideas that you have, I think, are so kind of practically applicable in a lot of different contexts. Um, one of the questions we also had is around, um, as we use this equitable frame around data, what advice do you have about developing the one page data highlight stories that are digestible mm -hmm. for executive directors and those in leadership positions who are asking for simplicity and the high level summaries, but that yep. might lack some of this nuance? What's the, what's the compromise? How do you manage that? I'll, I'll tell you what I personally do with the caveat that I'm unemployable. And that is that I have built in, because I agree there's like a big movement towards um, super streamlined, like put everything in an appendix, make one page or two pages and put the rest in an appendix. And I'm not against that. I actually think that that's a great idea. And when I do that, um, we put a colored bar <laughs> that says, um, well, what it says exactly depends on each report, but essentially um, I'll, I can send it around in the uh, materials. I sent it around already to the workshop people um, that says um, this data is not objective. Um, the production of this data project has gone through um, a seven step data pipeline process that's been embedded with the worldview and value system of um, the people working in all seven of those steps. So please, um, keep this in mind that this is one perspective and we've tested it. Like I, we've done it with Volkswagen. We've done that with capital one. <laughs> like it's doable in a corporate setting. We've done it with the Canadian government. We've done it with the Papua New Guinea government. It's doable. Um, and I think the only way to really get it acceptable is to find people that are ready and go with them. Like I'm not, I'm not doing any of this to kind of convince people that don't want to do it to do it but there's enough people that are ready to kind of get on the train and get the train going. And then more people will get on the train. This feels like the coronavirus disclaimers that I feel like every single COVID-19 <laughs> chart needs to have around the data gaps right. flaws and inaccuracies. So I, I'm right. fully on board with the state your limitations up front. So people know kind of what context they can consider the data in. But, but don't, but don't um, frame your limitations in such a kind of, jargony technical kind of way that it mm -hmm. just becomes like the iPhone agreement where you just skip it. <laughs> like it actually has to be meaningful. <laughs> yeah. no, totally agree. Uh, Will, do you have another question teed up for us? Yeah, so I think uh, one, but maybe a shorter question is, uh, have you written a book? And if not, would you consider it? Absolutely, we are working on it. Uh, yes, but if, if you have an offer, hit me up. <laughs> but we have a book proposal and it is circulating. <laughs> and what is the best way for all of us to follow the progress of that book? Uh, Wheelcount.com for sure. Um, so, so we, and our, we have a YouTube channel. Um, I'm on Twitter, but honestly, I'm terrible at Twitter. Um, Amanda had to drag me <laughs> to get my attention on Twitter. I'm good at email. I'm terrible at Twitter. Um, and, um, but we have a YouTube channel and we have a series, a uh, series of tools and ongoing blog posts, not just by me, but by a lot of people on weallcount.com. And we have a newsletter, actually, I should have pitched the newsletter. Um, we have a weekly newsletter that shares resources, that shares highlights of projects we're working on, projects that other people are working on. Oh, my communications person is going to be so mad that I didn't mention the newsletter. <laughs> Well, we'll include a link to the newsletter when we send out resources. Yes. <laughs> um, I think as we wrap up, wrap up, I think, Will, maybe we've got time for one or two more questions. Uh, do you want to tee us up with our last couple to share live? Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, tell, uh, one, we've got a question from Carl about how much prototyping do you do and sort of what your, iter you know, how, what your process looks like to make sure that you make equitable data visualizations. Yeah. So... The philosophy that we all count is that we are learning in public, that um, the only way that we could figure out um, how to get the racism, sexism, homophobia, and colonialism out of um, all of our analysis, all our data viz, was to try to do it in public and facilitate as much feedback as possible. So we prototype 
constantly. <laughs> and you'll notice that if you're on our website or if, if you've been to like more than one of my talks that they're not the same. Like Amanda <laughs> was at my talk last week and there are, the, some of the visualizations have changed because of the feedback we've received in the last four days. Um, we work very, very closely with, um, so I'm actually a recovering addict. I was very, very addicted for about 10 years to um, some very hard drugs. Um, and so I've been in rehab a number of times. So I'm very comfortable standing up and being like, hey, I'm, I'm a drug addict. I'm trying to recover. I've now been sober, but like, just so you know, I've now been sober for uh, 22 and a half years. Um, but right. I get up on a regular basis and say, I'm a, I'm a recovering um, addict. And that's how I feel about this too, that I often start a talk or a workshop with being, saying, I'm a recovering racist. I'm a recovering colonialist. I'm doing my best to recover. Um, certainly not sober. Um, and I have people that I consider sponsors. Like I have invested a lot in some um, relationships with the um, indigenous chiefs of Ontario, um, an indigenous women's group in um, British Columbia, um, uh, with several organizations of um, black women in the States and they are my sponsors. So everything that we do, um, we run by them for like, okay, what are we doing that's still horribly wrong in these things? And we pay them because you should pay women of color for the work that they do. <laughs> so yes, um, I hope that's the answer to the question. Everything so, we do is a prototype. We have nothing that's finished. We have no finished products. <laughs> we have nothing but prototypes. <laughs> so I think honestly, Heather, that's such a great note to end on in terms of just thinking about just like what a journey this is in terms of doing the work that it takes to go ahead and start to unpack a lot of these beliefs. I know that, I mean, I feel like I learn something new every time I hear from you, every time I see new visualizations from people like Mona Chalabi, or I see new content that comes out from even organizations that are doing this kind of advocacy work, uh, like the Black Women's Health Imperative, and learning about these organizations that are on the ground, really kind of trying to fight racism in their local communities, and then thinking about kind of what are we doing that inadvertently might be causing harm. And I know I've made my share of my own mistakes. And one of the things we always talked about, I remember since I started in international development was good intentions aren't enough. Good intentions are not going to be the thing that trumps poor impact or harm caused to another group of people. And that I think applies around the world, not just in the US. Oh, absolutely. I, I speak as a Canadian, like it's not like we're like sitting back like, we're, we got this, you guys are like a dumpster fire and we got this. Not at all. I've been, uh, or it is a it is a problem in lots of places. The, the specific symptoms of the problem are very specific to different geographies, but the problem is is certainly not. And I would go further than saying good intentions aren't enough. I think good intentions are a big part of the problem. Mm. Um, in that, um, I don't know if if thinking that you're doing something good is that great of a plan. <laughs> It is, I, I think it is just because the big question I think we keep asking ourselves as a data yeah. and data community is what can we do? And the answer I keep hearing from folks is spend more time learning first and then find meaningful ways to engage first by amplifying the voices of people of color and others. And I recognize I'm saying this and closing this out as a panel of white people talking yeah. about so I fully want to own the fact that that is somewhat cognitive dissonance right there, mm -hmm. but I no, do think that yeah. raising these conversations, having these conversations, um, bringing people like you've been thinking about this far before the, this kind of current interest in this topic kind of blew up. Um, is a really valuable way to engage more people in this conversation. And we can't thank you enough, Heather. This has been a tremendous learning experience for I think all of us. We are so excited to see the resources, share the links, we'll share the recording of this video. Um, I'm impressed we still got over half of our attendees just kind of <laughs> on for two hours. So thank you to all of you who've dedicated your evenings to us. Heather, thank you for all of your work and thinking about this and your transparency and honesty tonight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing all the resources. Yes. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. I was a real, uh, real delight and I appreciate it. All right. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you all later. Hope to see you at another event for DataViz DC. Take care, everyone. Bye.